started. And Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining today. Um, so let me just go ahead and get started. So I just wanted to welcome everybody and thank you for joining our first session on the introduction to ARO committees. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Kathy Sung from NIDCD at the National Institutes of Health, and I'm also the chair of the ARO Educations Committee. Uh, this past Monday, most of you, uh, if not all, probably received the volunteers needed email that looks just like what you see in this PowerPoint slide. And uh, some of you who are considering volunteering for ARO committees may not know their full roles and not sure which committees to volunteer for. So today we invited the chairs of five ARO committee uh, from Council, Diversity and Minority Affairs, Long Range Planning, program and membership to provide information about their roles and responsibilities. Uh, also, please join us again on March 22nd to hear from the chairs of additional committees that include travel awards, accessibility and accommodations, awards, external relations, finance, and educations committee. And uh, lastly, uh, let's see if I can get through. Lastly, um, and I just want to go through this quite briefly, um, for students, postdocs, medical residents, and fellows in the audience, we're, uh, we're also looking for volunteers to join Sparrow. Sparrow organizes and hosts several workshops at the ARO Midwinter Meeting and also has initiatives outside the Midwinter Meeting. The information session for Sparrow is next Wednesday on March 15th. So with that, uh, I'm excited to introduce you to the chairs of the five ARO committees today and would like to start with Dr. Yuri Agrawal from Council, who is uh, the current ARO president from Johns Hopkins University. So um, with that, the floor is yours, Dr. Agrawal. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you for organizing this event. Thank you for our uh, partners at Parthenon for helping to organize this too. I think it's a great partnership that we have, and so we're really excited about uh, telling you all about the various ways that you can get involved with ARO. So uh, I'm delighted and honored to be the president of ARO this year, and my term started a few weeks ago, so I'm learning as well kind of the extent of the organization. I definitely want to participate in the introduction to these committees to learn more about them, um, but specifically speaking about council. So this is the uh, group of individuals who um, essentially are charged with the management of the organization. And so that, um, in terms of individuals, um, consists of the uh, president, who is the chair of the council, the president-elect, who this year is Dr. Sunil Puria, the immediate past president, um, who's Lisa Olson, the secretary treasurer, um, Anna Lisikowski, the program chair, Dr. Cox, who's on this call as well, uh, the nominating committee chair, who's the past past president, who helps develop the slate of candidates, including for membership to council, um, and that this year is Dr. John, John Ogilai, the communications officer, um, who's Barbara Canlan, and then three elected members, um, and each elected member has a three-year term, and one member rotates off per year so we can have some continuity. And so this year, our members are uh, Dr. Manuel Malmierka, Dr. Avril Holt, or Avril Janine Holt, and Dr. Radha Kaluri. And uh, these are ways in which you know, members of our organization can get involved uh, by certainly participating and standing for election as member of our council. And so council meets, um, you know, just in terms of our operations, uh, we meet quarterly, roughly, and we essentially manage the affairs of the association. So amongst the major responsibilities that we have are um, establishing the venue, establishing the dates around the midwinter meeting, as that's kind of one of the major focuses of the organization, the association. And so we typically determine this, you know, multiple years in advance. And so I think at this point, we're setting the meeting location for 2026. Um, but we work closely with um, the management group Parthenon in terms of uh, developing locations um, for our subsequent meetings. Um, we also uh, plan the annual meeting in terms of the scientific program. We have general oversight over that, uh, along with the um, program committee, and then also set the business meeting uh, location and date, uh, which takes place at the uh, midwinter meeting. 
We also fill vacancies in terms of committee chairs and uh, also in terms of um, taking on new committees or new working groups um, as part of the association. So we sort of help uh, respond to member interests and uh, try to, to um, dedicate and divert resources to support those interests. Um, other activities are that each of us as members of council are liaisons to one or more of the arrow committees. And so as each of these committees meet, one member of council will serve as a liaison. And that really allows for when we meet as a council to have some um, understanding of what's uh, going on in each of the committees and ways that we can be helpful in terms of um, serving and furthering the interests of the committees. We also are involved in um, setting the budget for the organization, um, including setting the budget for the midwinter meeting and for the overall administration of the organization. And so, you know, reviewing what are the revenue lines and expenses of the organization and ensuring that we have um, a fiscally sound organization that we can then uh, pass on to, to subsequent councils. So those are generally the activities of the council. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about membership or specific ideas that um, individuals have. Every once in a while, we'll organize town halls uh, to the broader membership so we can interact directly and discuss matters of um, current interest or importance. And so, you know, certainly if members have anything that they would like to discuss in that uh, more open format, the council is certainly open to that if there are any issues that um, are specifically relevant for the membership at this time. Um, you know, some of the recent um, activities of council are that um, under Dr. Latovsky's tenure as president, um, we developed the Accessibility and Accommodations Committee. Um, and so there's definitely uh, movement and uh, new ideas that uh, gain sort of official um, participation within ARO um, as part of the activities of council. So happy to take any feedback or questions or um, comments from the group here. Okay, um, thank you so much. That was great. Um, does anybody from the group have any questions for Dr. Agrawal? Uh, you might, this is Doug Oliver, you might want to mention how you get onto the council for those of uh, who are participating that uh, don't know about the selection process. Absolutely. And, you know, Don, you can fill in a little bit on the exact dates, um, but essentially the nominating committee puts forward uh, potential uh, candidates for uh, council membership to be on the ballot for council membership. And so, um, you know, certainly it's based on participation in um, ARO, um, you know, individuals' contributions. And so that's typically how um, an individual may be considered to be a candidate for a council membership. You know, certainly that being said, if anyone has any interest in serving on the council, I think certainly letting anyone on the council know, you know, I'm happy to uh, to be notified of that, you know, if you have an interest, certainly letting this year it's Dr. Ogle I know who's on the nominating committee. Um, you know, I think those are all ways of, um, you know, trying to get more involved uh, and and potentially be on the ballot. Uh, but that's the process. It, it, it is the nominating group that puts an individual on the ballot. Um, the other thing I would say in terms of council activities are that, you know, we're also responsible and provide oversight for the journal, uh, the, the JARO journal. And so that's another, you know, interesting um, aspect of the work that we do, um, which involves, you know, a much broader audience than, than just the association, but also, you know, certainly involves all of our readership as well. Thank you for that question, Doug. Other questions or, or Don, do you have anything to add to that? You know, the only thing I will add is that you'll typically see that process come out for nominations about um, five to six months prior to the annual meeting. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, move on to our next committee. Um, thank you very much, Agrawal. Um, uh, our next committee is Diversity and Minority Affairs Committee, uh, and this is uh, led by Dr. Tezbir Kaur from Creighton University and Dr. Jeffrey Chang from Harvard Medical School. Take it on. Thank you.
Hi, hey, hello, thank you, Cathy, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Chen, and uh, I'm an investigator from Massachusetts uh, Engineering Infirmary in Boston. Um, this year, I'm serving as a co-chair for the Diversity and Minority Affairs Committee, uh, together with Jabir Kaur, and um, you will also hear a little bit from her in just a few minutes. Um, so the mission of uh, DMAC uh, is to, um, I'm just going to read out this listed on the AR website, the purpose of the committee is to create and curate an open, accepting and inviting community for ARO throughout the labs, the sections during the middle winter meeting and within your professional and the larger ARO communities. So how, how do we accomplish this goal? And we, we, did, uh, we did this by hosting uh, virtual sections throughout the year and also up to the middle winter meetings. Um, the goal of those sections is to be inclusive and educational to help members learn about the many facets of DEI. So we firmly believe all this engagement and conversation of, about um, DEI should be year around. So therefore, we uh, we usually uh, host uh, um, uh, roughly monthly monthly based uh, coffee hours virtually in on Zoom, and. Uh, through, uh, and the, through those coffee hour, we um, typically we have the committee members. Sometimes have the committee members to lead this discussion, uh, uh, which are highly relevant to the DEI. Or we also sometimes inviting uh, people from outside to lead the discussion. For instance, last year we invited uh, um, Gabby Merchant to lead a discussion about the LGBTQ. We also invited uh, um, Dr. Ruth Litvisky to lead a discussion about the mentorship. And uh, we also actually um, collaborating with other uh, uh, committees uh, within the ARO. Last year, we um, collaborated with accommodation committees where we, we invited the members from accommodation committees to share the stories about their um, uh, experience to cope with disabilities, you know. And I think we think those uh, coffee war hours are well received, and we typically uh, will uh, have um, 30 to 40, um, 50 attendants through, uh, for each section. And um, in the middle winter meetings, we we also host uh, usually a two hours workshop where um, uh, we we the a goal of those workshops is to have people to be involved so we can have inter interactive sections. Um, therefore, we have lots of facilitators throughout the workshop, and we also typically host a um, uh, symposium uh, at the middle winter meetings where we typically invite uh, four or five different speakers to come to uh, give uh, give us a lectures about um, some highly um, uh, relevant topics in the DEI. So um, uh, one more thing is that we also actually in charge of selecting travel awardees to be funded from the funds set aside from uh, for the DMAC. So, so you see, we have we do a lots of activities throughout the year, and um, uh, we would like to welcome new members to join the committee and uh, help us to to do better. So maybe Tabir, you want you have something to add? Yeah, I just thank you, Jeff, first of all, and thank you, Kathy, for organizing this. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal and Don, everybody. I think Jeff already gave a pretty good overview of uh, the mission and the activities that. Um, the DMAC uh, is involved in. Um, there's always scope to grow. Uh, so we are uh, very heavily relying on uh, new volunteers for our committee because it's a very active committee. So we always need motivated and very active members. We currently are encompassed of 10 members. Um, and uh, I may want to give you a little bit of the uh, racial proportion of the members. We have equal number of males and female um, members in our committee. And uh, in addition to that, we also have members of different um, a, a different levels. So we have members at junior uh, junior stages, mid level stages, and we also have members senior level stages. So it's a very diverse group in in that way. We have Sparrow volunteers 
who are very active. So um, besides integrating or collaborating with the Travel Awards Committee and the Accessibility Accommodations Committee, we've been very actively collaborating with the Sparrow Committee. And we basically um, request well, you know, what, what the Sparrow and other committees would like uh to be presented uh you know for the coffee hours or for the workshops in the symposiums i have been a member of this committee since 2019 um and then um i have been serving as a chair since last year uh and my understanding is and correct me if i'm wrong don but the the chair served for three years and then it's a rotating um, uh, process. So that's how okay. Jeff is now serving as a co-chair because uh, Dr. Radha Kaluri has moved on to the council to probably serve as a liaison between the council and the uh, Diversity Minority Affairs Committee. So yeah, I'll, I'll um, uh, say it again, what Jeff said is we are very actively uh, recruiting or very interested in getting more active volunteers into our committee and do some great work um, we, that we do throughout uh, throughout the year before the annual meeting. Thank you, yeah. If you have any questions, Jeff and I are here to um, address those. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Coward. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chang. Um, does anybody have any questions? In fact, I actually have a question. Does um, any of the workshops that Diversity and Minority Affair holds, um, uh, is it also, does it also occur during the midwinter meeting or is it always outside the midwinter meeting? So I can address that. Um, so the workshop and the symposium takes place at the annual meeting. Uh, and the way we do this is we uh, submit the abstracts. I think I've been uh, in contact with Dawn to get the deadline for the abstract submissions for both workshop and the symposium. So that's the first thing that the committee does. And then we do a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we don't want a lot of conversation to determine what topic we should do for workshop and symposium at the annual meeting. It's the coffee hours, Kathy, that are done um, um, month on a monthly basis. And for that, we have uh, a separate subcommittee. So they manage the coffee hours. And again, uh, we have a set of topics every year um, that we, um, you know, pick and choose based on our regular meetings and we are the subcommittee, the coffee hour subcommittee organizes those. Yeah. I just uh, one more uh, add on, as I uh, emphasized earlier, and we would like to ha have a year round uh, conversations, and that's why those coffee hour will be hosted uh, like like month on a monthly basis and uh, virtually throughout the. Yeah, I think the purpose of the coffee hours is to educate uh, and bring awareness, but workshop is more is more focused on doing actual uh, you know activities to uh, learn. Uh, tools and skills on how to, uh, you know, uh, address those challenges if we encounter them at work or even at home. So for that, we need longer time and we prefer doing it in person. So therefore, the uh, workshop is uh, at the meeting for uh, two, for the, for two, almost two hours. Yeah. And I think we are steady. We, as since I have been a member, uh, we, I, we have organized three workshops and I'm clearly seeing a steady growth uh, in the participation from ARO members at the workshop. So it's, it's pretty good, pretty exciting uh, to, to be part of this committee and do these kind of stuff, yeah. So our committee does meet monthly, so um, to plan for all these activities. So there's a lot of uh, exercise too. Um, okay, that's, that sounds great. Um, I guess I have one uh, small question that I think might help um, uh, individuals who are uh, interested in volunteering, which is how much time uh, commitment do you think it would be for individuals who are willing to volunteer uh, for this committee? So um, I, in my experience, serving both as a member and as a chair, I will say, um, it's it's not a lot. Uh, maybe you know 
one to two hours a week max. Uh, during the uh, during January month, like a month before the ARO um, annual meeting, uh, the, the committee becomes very active because we are planning the workshop and the symposium. So that may require a little bit more efforts, but overall it's not bad. We have monthly meetings. So that's just one hour. And if there is, if you're part of the uh, coffee hour subgroup, then you just work with the subgroup. If you're part of the travel award evaluation, then you work as on the travel award evaluation. Again, that's only during a limited window, which is November, December time. So it's it's not that bad. Jeff, if you want to add, since you were on the uh, coffee hour uh, subcommittee, how many yeah. hours were you spending? Uh, it's it's yeah, pretty much uh, on on a few hours per month, like to plan for the coffee hours. Yeah. And we do form the task groups and ask uh, committee members to sign up voluntarily. That's a great question, Gathi. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I have a question. How many new members the committee is planning to recruit this year? So that's mm -hmm. actually, I mean, there's no as such, um, a plan, I mean, more the merrier is the case because we have a lot of tasks under this, this large committee. So as, as you already came to know from Jeff's uh, presentation, we have four to five tasks each year. Uh, so again, more the better uh, so that, you know, it doesn't burden everybody and it, we, we can formulate the subcommittees. Yeah, so right now we have 10 and some of them will be rotating. Uh, so maybe an additional five will be really nice to have. Thank you, Tejbeer. Thanks, Jenny. Okay, okay, great. Um, thank you again, Dr. Tower and Dr. Chang. Um, we will move on to our next committee, uh, the Long Range Planning Committee. Um, thank you for being here, uh, Dr. Bonnie Lau. Um, she is from University of Washington in Seattle. So. Thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am the new incoming chair for the Long Range Planning Committee. And um, the primary role of the Long Range Planning Committee is really to survey the, the ARL members um, to identify uh, their needs and plan for uh, future changes uh, to the meeting and ARL as a whole. And so with that said, one of our primary responsibilities is to generate the survey that um, uh, each of you should have received following the mid winter meeting. And we sent that out uh, just after the meeting ends. And um, one of our primary responsibilities is to generate the survey beforehand and then to tabulate uh, and generate a report of the survey results to present to council. Um, in past years, we've also participated in uh, strategic planning. But I think um, I think that is set for the next four to five years. Is that correct? If anybody can uh, uh, jump in there and let us know when the next strategic planning cycle is. Um, so in the coming year, um, there will be a little bit of a lighter load, I think, in terms of meetings and responsibilities because we will not be doing any strategic planning. Um, the current membership of the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, we have 16 members. Uh, with Dr. Agrawal and also uh, Dr. Landig Landiger from the membership committee chair as a uh, part of our committee. We also have two SPARO members uh, that are uh, a part of the long range committee. And um, in terms of meeting timeline, January is also a busy time for us uh, in terms of preparing the survey. Uh, there's many other committees who send us a couple of questions or areas of, um, of interest that they have that they want to ask for information from the members. So we are working with other committees to include those questions into our survey. Um, in February, after the meeting, we distribute the questionnaire. And uh, in March, the, the survey closes. And that is when we begin reviewing the survey results and working with Parthenon to generate uh, the report for council. Okay, great. Yeah. 
Thanks. Just a quick uh, response to your question about the strategic plan. So it, in fact, was written 2021-22. Um, so there is a little bit of a reprieve from that process for the next few years, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I was I was just saying uh, in the past couple of years, we have met quite a bit Yeah. because of the strategic planning. But I think that leaves the long range committee with some um, availability uh, yeah. for brainstorming what we might want to participate in the next coming uh, years at least in the next three or four years, because we do have a little bit of uh, availability opened up from that. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, so just a quick follow up, if, if I may. Um, so it sounds like the survey closes in March. Do you have some sense at this point of the response rates? I know one thing we were thinking about are ways to increase the response rate for our members um, and what we might do to, you know, uh, establish some um, incentives for her, you know, for members who attend the meeting to, to respond. Yeah, that's actually a really great question. I might have to defer to Don for that one. Okay. Um, Kat Weiss, who is the uh, uh, outgoing chair, but still a member of our committee, uh, we are actually talking about this on the side via email about yeah. how we might be able to sort of, um, you know, the emails that was sent out, it was embedded in Quite a lot of formatting so we're, we're kind of having a side discussion on how we might if, if it's possible for us to send out one last reminder just highlighting the survey yeah right um, or something like that and i think we have time so if you have any suggestions um please let me know um, we of course want maximum response mm -hmm. and i would agree with that i think you know what we're really going to have to think through is maybe how to feature what this survey actually impacts and for people to see the impact of the survey results in different ways. So maybe that's us really taking the survey and flushing it out and really highlighting the different aspects of the meeting that have been impacted by the feedback of the members. The one thing we struggle with with incentives is that it is anonymous. We want it to be so people feel very free um, to give their true feedback. And so that's something that we're always up against a bit um, is keeping that um, you know, survey anonymous while still highlighting that it, it really is impactful to the organization. That's a good point. When does the survey close, Don? And do you have some early sense of the response rates? Yeah, so the we give 30 days um, typically unless there's, um, you know, CEs offering, offered with recordings and stuff, sometimes we'll extend that just a little bit, but we try to get everything in 30 to 45 days at the most, um, because it's fresh in people's mind. Right now, we're seeing a lot of positive feedback. I've been checking from time to time, come in, we have um, well over 100 responses. So I just looked up last year's response rate and, and just keeping in mind that last year we were still um, not fully in person. So last year we had 484 responses to the survey and that, that's about 23% of the people who attended the meeting. Got it. Yeah. So I think there's some great opportunities here to think yeah. about, you know, how to get you know, and certainly that's a great number. And so, you know, we may not um, get a whole lot more information, you know, by getting more people. But I think, you know, obviously the more people we can hear from, because um, we we may end up hearing more from people who have certain kinds of feedback to make or who are, you know, uniformly happy. And so just to make sure that we can get an even sense of of, of the organization. So that could be something we could brainstorm about on the committee, you know, ways that we can feature the survey and, you um, you know, sort of encourage people to respond because of the impact that it'll have on the organization. So. Right, that's a great point. Even if um, all of the committees can help us pass on the word and yeah. uh, just brainstorm with their own committees on how we might be able to um, increase response to the, to, the, to the survey, that would be already, I think, a big step. Okay, great. Dr. Oliver, I think has a question. Uh, yes, um, I was wondering, uh, does the Long Range Planning Committee play a role in uh, deciding where the meeting will be held in the future? That is a really great question. When we had our meeting at ARO this past 
this past uh, ARO meeting, that was actually one of the topics that the long, the current long range planning committee um, felt pretty, uh, was a big priority for us. And so, I mean, we haven't talked to Dr. Agrawal or anyone else, but it's something that we actually wanna become more involved in if possible. John, do you want to say anything about that? I know that we usually have these conversations in council. Yeah, I, I think that's a conversation we'll have to carry forth into the council meetings and see um, how we could incorporate that feedback um, from the long range planning committee. Um, I do know it's, you know, these decisions are never easy. Um, and so it may be where we can look at that committee, we can look at, um, all of the feedback we're getting and maybe the committee can make some recommendations to the council to consider um, but we definitely will talk about this in an, on an up, upcoming committee or council meeting to see how we could really go about incorporating that voice okay that was definitely a concern a, a priority interest for the, the committee that we self-generated yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think there's so many factors that are that limit the parameter space a bit in terms of the location in terms, you know, close to international airport that accommodates our minimum, that has reasonable hotel prices, you know, that can accommodate our date and time footprint. And so that makes it, you know, it narrows the pool considerably. But if there are other considerations, you know, that are relevant to the membership, I think certainly, you know, that could help guide the decision making. So yeah, we've had a lot of members bring up. Um, uh, different different parameters that we may perhaps think of, like for example, in California, uh, some of the the our members based out of California are, are actually not allowed to. There's a, the list of states that are um, I think anti-abortion. Yeah, that they are not allowed to be reimbursed for coming to the meeting. So this meeting that they had to to fund and support on their own because it was in Orlando and things like that. So we, we became aware of some of these issues from talking to members at the ARO. And so we just started generating a list, um, yeah. which we hope will come up in the survey, uh, but um, we, will, we will soon see. I think yeah. another, another parameter that was brought to attention to the DMAC was uh, LGBTQ, especially for this past ARO, was the LGBTQ, uh, you know, uh, member participation in the meeting at Florida. So that was another uh, factor, uh, maybe I, maybe to be considered for future planning. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and we, you know, we've had similar conversations in council, you know, because I think we're trying to figure out how to navigate this and whether we want to have, you know, some kind of a specific policy or, you know, that guides us in terms of thinking about these considerations and thinking about, you know, the safety of our own members who are attending the meeting, you know, and then the reimbursement issue, I, I actually hadn't heard about, but that's an interesting angle as well. And I think one of the things we were talking about is that, you know, since we're planning for 2026, it's so hard to know in some ways, you know, <laughs> what the landscape is going to be then. Um, and so, but I think, you know, we obviously have to make some decisions with the best knowledge that we can. And so incorporating all these considerations, I think is really important. So um, certainly we're open to it and we want all the committees to feel empowered to send us information that they're hearing from their committee members and from the membership. Um, that may or may not come through the survey um, that would be relevant to the decision making of the council. So um, just putting that out there that, you know, I, I definitely want to hear that. And I think the council does too. Okay, great. Thank you. I just had one brief question for the purpose of volunteers. Um, are you, uh, is Long Range Planning Committee also looking for um, regular members as well as Sparrow members? You've indicated that there's two Sparrow members currently serving the Long Range Planning Committee. Yes, we welcome we welcome anybody who is interested in uh, joining the committee. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. All right. Um, for the interest of time, we're going to move on to our next committee, um, the program committee. Uh, Dr. Brandon Cox from Southern Illinois University and Dr. Steve Lomber from McGill University for joining. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm Brandon Cox. I am the newly elected program chair uh, taking over for um, Matt Kelly. 
So I'll just briefly go over um, the main role or function of this committee. And then Steve has, has much more experience in the actual day-to-day -day, uh, execution of our mission. So I'll let him speak on more specifics. So in general, the program committee is in charge of reviewing all the abstracts and sorting them into talks or posters and organizing those sessions in a cohesive fashion and order, as well as recruiting the moderators for the podium sessions. Um, we also solicit proposals for symposia and workshops. And we as a committee review those, those submissions to um, score and rank them. Um, for the appropriate time slots that we have. So we have a limited number of symposia, young investigator symposia and workshop slots available. So depending on how many submissions we get, we can accept um, you know, majority or a portion of them. Um, and then we also seem to have an increasing number of symposia that are in memora, um, memorial of someone who's passed away or honoring someone who's retired recently. Um, and so again, there's a, um, submission call for those so we can work them into the program itself. And then finally, as the program um, chair um, with Steve Lombard, who is the scientific program chair, we are basically putting together the meeting and what sessions are happening on what day and what time and trying to ensure the best of our ability that there's not overlapping to topics happening concurrently and trying to fit everything in. And um, I think the last thing that I'll say is our committee has members who have specific expertise in certain topic areas. So each committee member is assigned a certain topic. And so it's really important when people submit their abstract that they choose the most appropriate topic area for their um, research so that it goes to the right person and can be um, put together in a nice package with similarly related um, themes. Um, we have about 10 members or so who are finishing their term, um, and Yuri will be in charge of finding replacements. <laughs> so we will have some turnover this year. And I'm going to let Steve uh, take over with more details. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear. Okay, okay, I can hear, but I can't see me. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, Brandon covered pretty much what the uh, committee does. Is uh, um, for the most part, the membership's concerned with coordinating the scientific program uh, for the meeting, both uh, with symposia and for the actual submission of the abstracts, and then making sure that uh, everything is you know thematically organized well. Uh, I think we've all run into meetings where you want to be in multiple places at the same time, but we try to coordinate the meetings so that uh, uh, people with particular interests, uh, hopefully there's uh, not real conflicts in the different things that you'd like to see or experience at the meeting. Um, so that things are relatively seamless. Um, there are two, are two major activity periods are obviously right after the submission of the symposia, uh, when we're doing the reviewing of the symposia in the spring, and then in the fall after the submission of the abstracts, uh, when we're going through and uh, determining posters and uh, talks and putting together thematic uh, talk sessions that represent the uh, the abstracts that have actually been uh, submitted. Um, so we really have two major activity periods during the year. Um, otherwise, um, we're relatively quiet. But uh, yeah, that, that's the, the the major purpose of the at least the scientific part of the program committee is to uh, uh, do the abstracts and uh, symposium reviews. And I pass. Okay, great. Is there any questions from the audience? So I actually have a, a question. Uh, in terms of uh, people who want to volunteer for this committee, um, could you uh, talk about how much time commitment it is, especially when, when the abstract comes in and you start reviewing them? Uh, and uh, is there a uh, is there are you also looking for Sparrow members as well? And if they if you are looking for Sparrow members, like would it just be as a representative or is there a role for Sparrow members for this committee? Um, so my understanding is we currently have a Sparrow member um, and that person's term is ongoing. Um, I don't know. Um, I defer to Steve and Don if there's room for additional members. Um, as far as timeline, um, 
I think there is a chunk of time required to review the symposia and workshop submissions, and that's going to be in the May to June timeframe. Um, and then there'll be, of course, a chunk of time in October after abstract after submissions um, and sorting those into the talks and the podiums. But those are the two main times. We have, I think, one um, additional Zoom call kind of introducing everybody to each other and talking about the process, um, again, probably in the May, June timeframe. But Steve, please, please elaborate um, uh, your thoughts there, too. About how many how much how many hours it takes to yeah. review these these things? The uh, the time in the fall is significantly longer than in the spring. Uh, in the spring, I would say the typical person probably spends six hours reviewing the symposium uh, applications. Then we have a meeting to review all of them, and then in the fall, um, I would say it's probably more like uh, eight hours or twelve hours to um, uh, go through all the abstracts and thematically organize them uh, in, into individual sessions. So uh, it's a larger time commitment in the fall than in the spring. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay, so um, if there isn't any more questions, um, we'd like to move on to the membership committee. Um, we welcome Dr. Lucas Landegger from Medical University of Vienna and Dr. Douglas Oliver from University of Connecticut. Thank you for joining. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. I mean, Doug already said a few things, so um, I'll briefly introduce the membership committee. Um, the membership committee is actually fairly new because before it was known as the international committee. I already served as the chair of the international committee. And then the idea was that um, we would um, rather represent all members of Aero. And so that's why we decided to have two co-chairs, uh, Doug and myself, uh, who are now uh, one of those co-chairs should be based internationally um, and one of those co-chairs should be based nationally. Um, and we currently have nine members uh, serving in our committee, uh, including uh, the two co-chairs and um, kind of all types of hearing research are covered, all types of backgrounds are covered. So we have people who are primarily um, scientists, we have people who are primarily clinicians, uh, people who do both. Um, and the long range planning committee that um, yeah, we kind of already heard what they're doing. They gave us a lot of tasks uh, that were comedy specific. And um, now we formed a task group. So um, every one of us uh, kind of serves on two or three of those task groups. And um, some of those tasks uh, involve uh, kind of to develop a new uh, member welcome process uh, to in general, uh, in general, provide new impulses for the Arrow online presence, uh, presence. So the newsletter, the website, uh, presence on social media. Um, opportunities for networking and collaboration outside of the midwinter meeting because um, the society still kind of primarily focuses on the uh, annual meeting and uh, to highlight the work and achievements of members across the globe um, to kind of also show the members based in the US that it's not just a national organization but a truly international organization um, to also attract uh, and maintain young persons to the aero community, um, specifically with uh, a lot of people going into industry, um, yeah, trying to keep them in, in hearing research and um, ideally academic hearing research uh, based on the, the comedy uh, structure. Um, and also to identify underrepresented uh, underrepresented regions on a global scale and try to kind of um, recruit scientists from these areas or, or kind of pitch the idea of Aero to scientists uh, in those areas so that they potentially join Aero as well and uh, potentially can um, join a midwinter meeting. And also to look at the funding mechanisms to allow Aero members to go to other uh, clinically focused meetings to kind of have more um, influx of, of, of um, different people or people with different backgrounds. And because collaborations with other committees, um, because that was mentioned before, we also do that obviously. So we, for example, had a, a collaboration with the Travel Awards Committee and then um, I think a year and a half ago or so, we um, together um, after the uh, after council agreed, uh, we could actually increase the travel award for the international members because obviously flights, et cetera, are more expensive if you come in from abroad uh, to travel to the uh, midwinter meeting compared to if you just have to do that nationally. 
And uh, another focus of our committee is the uh, Meet the Expert International Lecture Series. So we're trying to do that quarterly now. We've had two lectures um, so far uh, by experts that are based internationally. And um, yeah, that kind of uh, goes along with the thing that we mentioned before to highlight the work and achievements of, of members across the globe. And yeah, I think that's a, a brief overview. And uh, Doug, if you have anything to add, please feel free. And otherwise, we're happy to answer any questions. So, sorry, I have to turn on my microphone. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lucas. Uh, I think the membership committee, as it's currently structured now, is really focused on building the Aero community. Uh, and I think that's a good way to think about it. We would like to get new people into the aero community uh not just um international members but also young investigators students postdocs uh, have them transfer from sparrow perhaps uh, but mostly but even you know try to let people know uh, students know who are not already affiliated with sparrow or aero uh, about the organization and to do that we need to be able to find ways to let them know how the ARO community can be valuable to them and their career. Uh, and then that goes through to the existing members uh, in order to make membership useful to international members and uh, other and members uh, domestically. Uh, it, uh, we want to find ways to help them communicate with each other, to network, uh, it, it all comes down to making ARO a very useful thing for anybody who's part of it. Uh, and so any way we can find to do that is going to be helpful and relevant to the membership committee. And so we can use new members from all over. Uh, we need old members, new members, domestic members, international members. Um, if you're interested in this process of building community, I think this is a really good committee to participate in. Um, and I think that it, you know, it touches so many aspects of what we do. Um, um, I, I think there's real value in participating if you uh, can do it. We, we usually meet about once a month for an hour, uh, virtual meetings. And the, if you're on a task group, you'll talk to those people and work on ideas of what we can do. But uh, we really do need to reach out to the membership in general to to generate new ideas about how we can uh, build the community. And so all of the, I encourage all the committee members and council members to, to, you know, let Lucas and I know if you have ideas about how we can build the community and uh, be more beneficial to existing members and attract new members. All right, thank you. So one of the things that actually, um, seems like that stands out is that um, Sparrow, as part of uh, some of the ongoing initiatives, we're also talking a lot about building a community and also um, trying to say, for example, during the ARO um, midwinter meeting, we also have um, what's, we also try to implement what's called a buddy system to um, try to incorporate newer people into the community. And uh, I wanted to ask the question if uh, membership is also kind of in communication with Sparrow uh, in terms of some of the initiatives and, and plans that are ongoing. I believe we plan to have uh, a meeting with uh, Eliason from Sparrow. We currently have uh, graduate students and postdocs as members, uh, although I don't know, well, one of them I think is in Sparrow. Um, exactly. Alejandro is the Sparrow representative. So we do have an official representative and there is a connection um, with Sparrow, obviously, and uh, yeah, trying to uh, pitch ideas back and forth. Uh, but now we want to make it kind of even broader and, and ask them specifically uh, regarding the social media, because I mean, the, the, yeah, the, it's very different how... Um, I don't know, uh, a senior professor consumes social media compared to how Sparrow people uh, consume uh, social media. So we definitely want to get their input there as well. Well, also the Sparrow members have already kind of joined into the community to a certain extent. Uh, and we also want to recruit new members who are not currently in Sparrow uh, or currently investigators and, or, and young investigators, new investigators, 
who are not currently members of ARO, uh, regardless of age. Uh, so, I mean, Sparrow is really good because it's a it's a nice community of young investigators and students who who already know a lot about what's going on uh, in ARO, and so they they can be quite beneficial in helping us with the process of attracting uh, new investigators and new students who are not already part of ARO. Great, thank you so much. Does anybody from the audience have any questions? Yeah, this is Bo Hawaii. I have a question, pretty general question. Uh, so I was wondering what's the process of uh, uh, to have someone to serve in the committee? Uh, so if individuals submit their, their interest in to serve a certain committee, so what's the process for that? Because I recall I served as a program committee many, many years ago. So that was invited. So I was wondering what's the current process? So, so I can answer that. There is an open call for volunteers right now going on. Um, there will be a reminder for that at following this um, session. And so we invite everybody to apply um, wherever your interest levels are. And then the committee chairs will take a look at interest levels, match, um, you know, match passions and skill set and all of that. And then we will select committee members. Thanks. Okay, any further questions? Okay, um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just curious about what the um, proportion of our membership the, that resides outside of the states, and is that proportion actually reflected in ARO leadership? That is a very good question. I do know it is very intentional that we are diverse in our committees. Um, and so one of the things that we did with the membership committee to make sure that we're really paying attention um, to our complete audience and membership is we um, blended together the international committee um, into the new membership committee. That way we weren't working on things separately, but we were really looking at the membership as a whole. I will say looking at the membership, we are still, a, you know, ARO is still a good 60 to 70 percent U.S. based. And I think we have our work cut out for us there. And that's um, part of the strategic plan is that we are very intentional with inclusion and diversity. We're ensuring that our leadership, um, both, you know, within committees and council, and also looking at our members on the committee to make sure that there's a balance and that we are um, seeing our entire membership reflected there. And so that is something that is ongoing, but I know it's very important to the membership committee as one of their charges. Steve, if I could make a comment, uh, when we had virtual meetings, we had a lot of participation from Europe and outside the U.S. because uh, it was easy for people to get there. Uh, we could get a lot of participation from young people who, you know, might not be able to get paid to to uh, come to the U.S. and attend a meeting. Uh, you know, their professors have the money and not all the young uh, graduate students get to travel. Uh, so uh, it, actually, it's the structure of the program is actually very important to um, this business of international participation. And uh, some, you know, some elements of the hybrid programs were really useful, and uh, they they allowed people to participate who just wouldn't be able to participate otherwise. Uh, and so I think that that uh, you know it's a really global issue. In fact, the membership committee has this issue just when we try to have meetings because we have all these different time zones. Uh, you know, we have you know Vienna, Portland, Oregon. Uh, India, we have a member in India, uh, a member in Colombia. I mean, uh, sometimes, I mean, but this is kind of the challenge with being an international organization. Um, and I think the council and the membership committee, the program committee 
all of the committees need to take that into consideration. Thanks, and also because we briefly mentioned the survey, um, we obviously look at the survey results specifically also for international members. And there we saw that San Jose, for example, the last uh, pre-pandemic meeting was not an ideal location because the airport was rather small. So for international members to fly there um, was was not ideal. But uh, yeah, that was it was considered now for with the with the future locations. Okay, um, great. Is there any last minute comments uh, from the, um, the committees that they would like to say? Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think I just wanna um, end by saying thank you to everybody who joined today. And I also wanna really thank um, our uh, PMG, um, uh, Don Kegler for you know, um, having to organize this as well. And um, also I wanna uh, again, remind everybody that we do have uh, the ARO committee, the introduction to ARO com uh, committee coming up on March 22nd. Um, we have six committee that is going to be, uh, that is going to be uh, joining that day. And uh, just one last thing for next week, we are also doing an introduction to Sparrow. Um, March 15th. So I hope to see uh, a lot of you there as well. So uh, again, thank you everybody for joining today. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy, for a great program. And thanks to all the committee chairs for participating today. Great to see everyone. Thanks, Don. Thank you. Okay, have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.